Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Judy Lamini. I chair the GPVF Response Fund One Board. I would like to start by thanking our hosts, Professors Barry Delosky and Bruce Melader, and the whole team that assisted in hosting this workshop uh, on behalf of the fund. Our esteemed panelists that I'll introduce shortly, Dr. Mpumi Zungu from the HSRC, who is also the co-leader of the NSP multi-sectoral collaborative platform for Pillar 6. Sips Mtembu from the presidency, who's also the other co-leader from the same pillar. DDG from the Department of Women, Youth and People with Disabilities, Ms. Shoki Chabalala. Colleagues from the NRF, the CSIR, members of government, NGO representatives who are here, members of civil society, members of the board, the private sector, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. I represent a young organization, the GBVF Response Fund One, which was launched by the president six months ago, facilitated by the IWFSA. The total shutdown movement in 2018 led to the presidential summit, which was followed by the interim steering committee, which gave birth to the national strategic plan uh, for GBVF. The purpose of the NSP of the GBVF is to provide a multi-sectoral coherent strategic policy and programming framework to strengthen a coordinated national response to the crisis of gender-based violence and femicide. As the fund, our mandate is to mobilize resources, both financial and non-financial, from different sectors of society, led by the private sector, to enable the implementation of the six pillars of the NSP with the aim of eradicating gender-based violence and femicide. In our six months of existence, we have sought to form partnerships to tap into existing resources over and above issuing the RFP, which was closed uh, four days ago. This will enable us to strengthen implementing agencies, namely NGOs and community-based organizations, but it will also help us to tap into the resources from different sectors uh, of society to help fight the scourge. One of the outcomes of our board's theory of change deliberations was the resolve to play a facilitation role in the development of the GBVF dashboard. Professor Berry and Bruce were very willing to contribute to fight the sketch by contributing uh, through their skills. We, hold, we actually chose to hold this workshop sooner rather than later. Benjamin and Finn, have worked tirelessly to play and lay the foundation for the starting of the dashboard. As it has been shown many times, data has to be accurate and reliable to drive the right policies and correct intervention at the correct level. This workshop is our first engagement on data in the GBBF space firstly, but also on mobilizing big data and AI against gender-based violence and femicide. We look forward to engaging with you in the next two hours. In the first part of the deliberations, we'll hear from a panel that represents diverse skills and disciplines from South Africa and different parts of our continent. You may have seen from the invite that one of the panelists is Dr. Sorry, is Advocate Bonnie. Kari Gamo, uh, when she took ill, I'm pleased to say that advocate Pierre Smith uh, stepped into her shoes and he'll be the first uh, panelist uh, this, this evening. Advocate Pierre Smith is the Senior Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions of the Specialized Unit in the NPA Head Office, a Sexual Offenses and Community Affairs Unit. The mandate of the unit covers GBVF re related matters. He has extensive expense. Exp 
He has extensive expertise in this field for the past 30 years, including management and strategic direction and prosecution of several related cases of the high court and regional court level. He's been involved in specific legislative drafting, research and training development. Uh, over to you, Advocate Pierre. Afternoon, colleagues. It's good to be with you and thank you, Dr. Judy, for the introduction, much appreciated. Um, I will start with sharing my document. I hope it's visible to all. Yes, yep, it is. Good to go. Thank you. I will then proceed. As indicated, my presentation is quite lengthy. Colleagues will see it's 26 um, slides, but I'm only going to focus on certain slides that are quite relevant for the purpose of this discussion and workshop today. So pardon me if I'm flying through some of the slides is because they are not, not relevant, but they're not maybe so crucial for the presentation for today. Um, the overview about the focus of the NSP and the presidential summit on GBVF has been done by Dr. Judy. So I'm going to move on to the slide that says the second pandemic. We all know that gender-based violence has been dubbed as the second pandemic in South Africa. So the big question is for us in the National Prosecuting Authority is specifically in, in relation to the fact that we have some of the most advanced and progressive legislation in the world dealing with GBV matters, yet it remains an immense hurdle to overcome constructively in our society. So the big question is how do we collectively win the war against gender-based violence and femicide. So I also thought it would be quite prompt to refer to certain Supreme Court of Appeal decisions that reflectively displays the importance of gender-based violence and specifically in this regard, sexual offenses over a period of decades. The first case that's on the slide that I refer to is the Gauteng versus Tabete matter, which although it was delivered in 2011, refers to State versus Chapman, which is also a Supreme Court of Appeal case, which was delivered by the court in 1997. And already at that stage, it was referred to in relation to the offense of rape as the humiliating, degrading, and brutal invasion of the privacy, the dignity, and the person of the victim. The court in Kasu, meaning Tabete, stated the following. It is regrettable that notwithstanding this observation, the rate of rape in this country has reached pandemic proportions. It is no exaggeration to say that rape has become a scourge or a cancer that threatens to destroy both the moral and social fabric of our society. The next case that I also thought is relevant for colleagues to be aware of is specifically in the environment of the fact that in this instance, we're dealing with a six-year-old boy that was the unfortunate victim of the offense of rape. So in Grahamstown versus Musikizi Pele, the Supreme Court of Appeal made the following judgment in his um, delivered judgment. The complainant in this instance is an innocent, defenseless and vulnerable victim of the respondent's despicable and cruel act. The respondent even in addition threaten and assault the complainant to achieve his purpose. The complainant will have to live with the emotional scars and stigma of having been humiliated and violated for the rest of his life. The curse in our society of rape is considered by the courts and society alike as deserving of severe punishment. This was part of the Supreme Court of Appeal judgment in 2018. Colleagues will then note that I referred to a period of since 1997 with Chapman until this case in 2018. Later on, the crucial role that the courts do play in relation to the imposing of severe uh, sentences for purposes of punishment will become clear. Um, so despite this observation, as reiterated, it's still a massive challenge in this country. The shocking re reality of gender-based violence has still not been eradicated or minimized. Now, the NPA has, over a couple of years, imposed or improved certain service delivery response mechanisms to eradicate or to address our reaction or response and how we should deal 
with gender-based violence. And that doesn't mean by all means that we are at a place where we want to be. This is an ongoing responsibility. And I need to stress that, that it is ongoing in relation to the fact that it places a huge responsibility on the development of what we should do and how we actually implement it to ultimately ensure that there will be a specific concerted focus on how we deal collectively in the criminal justice sector with gender-based violence. I thought it was also crucial just to, to encapsulate what has been said in the executive summary of the UNODC needs assessment report on women who uses drugs conducted in four cities in South Africa, which was published in 2019. It says on page one, culturally embedded power imbalances that exist between men and women around the world often leave women exposed to increased stigma, abuse, violence, and coercion. Unfortunately, so true in the current environment that we live in, specifically when we look as women as part of the vulnerable group and also children in relation to gender-based violence. Now, the core function of the NPA, as we all know, is prosecution. Hence, we are active in the criminal justice sector. But what is a crucial element for us in dealing with our prosecutors and officials dealing with gender-based violence is their understanding of social context awareness. How do we train our people to be the front soldiers in doing the best they can when we are supposed to deal with um, the prosecution of these matters in a top-notch level? That is crucial in going forward, and I will talk about that later a little bit more. We've obviously kick-started with the Department of Justice in line with Section 55A, the designation of sexual offences courts, to specifically focus on how we should deal with sexual offences in this environment. We obviously deal with public awareness and outreach programs, and we've picked up that the Tutuzela case centres, which I will talk about later as well, um, as a specific responsibility in this regard. Since we have gone out and actively and proactively did public awareness in relation to um, sexual offenses and the domestic violence and gender-based violence, we've noticed a considerable increase in these number of matters being reported at the TCC, which is what we want, because ultimately then those victims can get the necessary services. And ultimately, if there are cases being registered, then those cases can be finalized in a court of law depending obviously under the circumstances when cases are being taken to court as trial and court ready. We also currently developed a femicide protocol on how collectively we in the NPA should deal with femicide matters and GBVF is a national priority for all the divisions, the DPP officers in the 11 divisions of the nine provinces. We currently also have a concerted focus with SAPS, Forensic Science Laboratory, on the management of the DNA analysis priority initiative, as we call it. Now, if we, on the next slide, I will focus more on what the focus or what the, the catchment area of the TCCs would be. The TCC model is a one-stop integrated rape care management model, so to speak. The focus is victim-centered, court-directed, with prosecutor-guided investigations and stakeholder cooperation. The objectives are to minimize secondary victimization, to reduce the cycle period in relation to those cases being placed on the court roll and when eventually being finalized, and improve convictions. Ultimately, for us, convictions is, is, an, is a yardstick that indicates to us the quality and successes of those cases being finalized. But there's an overrider. It should never be read in isolation. One should always look at convictions in line with the number of cases being finalized and also in relation to the finalization rate, which I will talk about later as well. We've got specific criteria that we utilize for the establishment of these sites. For instance, you look at SAP statistics, the court statistics in the area where we have identified a possible site to be established, a balance between rural versus urban areas, if the area is particularly prone to gangsterism or drug abuse, because in both instances, we found that many of those are catalysts or instigators to sexual offenses being committed against the vulnerable. 
What we've also noticed is that in relation to the matters that are reported at the TCCs, we hover around an average of 57% between children, which is the, the predominant number, versus adults. So it means that of all our victims that are being reported matters at TCCs, 57% of them would be on children. An additional factor is we do also have domestic violence matters reported at the TCCs, but the predominant number of sexual offences or the number of matters reported would be sexual offences, 90%, as I reflected, of which the offence of rape would account to about 65% of all those matters. Now, between the 2015-16 to, to the 2019-2020 financial years, we assisted with 169,000 of victims that we ensured uh, received that crucial services. And I will talk about the focus of that services and who is responsible for that as well. Now, in the 2020-21 financial year, obviously due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we noted also a decrease of about 16.6% in matters reported compared with the previous financial year, as I indicated, due to the impact of lockdown regulations into ALIA, the, the total number that matters that we reported for last year was 29,593. So if we total that up as from 2015 to 2020, 2021, the total number of victims that received services would be 198,618. I said already what the focus of the Drusella Care Centre model is. It falls under the auspices of the NPA, Soccer Unit, National Prosecuting Authority. Um, what is also crucial here is to note the fact that it has been regarded as an international best practice model in dealing with sexual offence matters holistically. We've got 55 sites at the moment in all of the nine provinces, 11 divisions, and we're in the process of establishing an additional six sites on CARA funding, which was allocated to us by Parliament, specifically for the Tudozella Care Centre model project. Um, I spoke about what the focus of the TCC model is. What is also relevant is that the success of this model is a multidisciplinary approach to GBVF. We as the NPA and the soccer unit are purely spearheading the process, but the departments of health, SAP, social development, and to a, a smaller extent DOJ, because they're responsible for the establishment of the courts and specifically civil society organizations, play a crucial role in the ultimate success of this model to be implemented and the services that are to be provided. What I've done in this slide is basically to give colleagues a breakdown of what is expected of a specialist sexual offense prosecutor or case manager being appointed for the TCC model at the TCC sites and to manage these cases, to be responsible for the prosecutor guided investigations and also to be responsible where required to prosecute these matters. Their focus is to ensure that these cases are trial and court ready in a shorter space of time with the least amount of secondary victimization. So this gives a breakdown and indication of what we include in the skills development program of these colleagues. Um, the additional point is, is that ultimately we want to improve service delivery and quality trauma containment needs to be provided to victims as assistance. And in addition to that, the forensic medical examinations being delivered by the Department of Health is absolutely essential. In many instances, close to more far than 90%, your forensic medical examination is your most crucial part of evidence when you take these cases to a court of law because in many instances, you're dealing with a single witness and all the challenges in that regard, but you also deal with a limited number of additional witnesses that can corroborate the version. So you also deal with circumstantial evidence. All of that makes these cases traumatic and challenging to actually have a successful prosecution in a court of law. Now, statistics for us is crucial because ultimately, and, and data collation is for us a tool to motivate why we need additional funding or a bigger budget being allocated or whatever the point might be, or even donor funding which in the past we received extensively support in that regard. And in the beginning years, in, in, in the 2000, 2002, 
when we started with these um, to the ZRK centers, we relied heavily on donor funding support. Now the TCC model for our focus from the NPA side is government funded and totally part of the voted funds in that regard. But we still receive and still require donor funding to assist us with other crucial services, for instance, research to be implemented, for instance, equipment, crucial equipment to be provided, or how we can constantly improve service delivery at these sites. So conviction rights, as I said before, are crucial. That's just to give uh, colleagues a reflection on where we stood with the conviction rate for sexual offenses in 2010, 60%, where we're standing now, 75%. Um, here I've just given a breakdown in the performance of the TCCs on victims assisted and matters being reported. I just want to go to the second bullet here, where I said over this five year period, it reflects an 8.2% increase in matters reported and services provided for victims at this 55 sites. As from the 2011, 2012 financial year, I compared that with the 2019, 2020 financial year. And colleagues will see that there's a total number of victims that were assisted, 291,802, which is a 24.3% increase in matters being reported. Yes, people can say it's because you have more sites, but it's also for us an indication on the belief and also the motivation that people have to go and report these matters at these sites, but also based on the success of the public awareness campaigns being implemented. However, it must also be noted that not all matters reported at a TCC will necessarily end up in a police docket being open. Many instances, specifically adult victims, because for a child victim, a docket must be open and investigated. But for an adult victim, they have the right to choose if they want a police investigation to be implemented or not. And we're sitting at the moment on an average of 35% of those dockets or those matters that are not going to be registered as a docket for possible investigation by SAPS. And there might be many reasons. It might be because the alleged offenders are totally unknown, which is the predominant reason to the victim. He or she doesn't have any idea. And even if we have to investigate it at that stage, it would be quite challenging because of there's simply no information available. Um, in relation to the next slide, what I've done here is also to give a breakdown in relation from 2008 to 2009 financial year to also relate to the increase in the conviction rate from 61.2 to 74.9, which shows an improvement of 13.7%. Um, I think I want to move over to the next slide in relation to the first Roman number one. In 2019-2020, we dealt with 1,473 accused, that's purely at TCC cases reported. Sentence of which 421 received either life imprisonment, which for us, according to the Minimum Sentences Act, is the most severe sentence that you can get for the rape offence in line with Schedule 1 of that piece of legislation, or they received between 20 to 25 years, which equals 28.5%. And if we look at what that similar position is for the comparative study in the previous financial year, you would see it's 25.4%. So hence we state there's an improvement by the courts to impose more severe sentences of 3.1%. The next slide is also crucial just for us to focus on a few pointers as well. As indicated, um, what I've indicated here, a 7.5% in the two comparative periods on improvement of 10.8% versus the previous financial year, once again, in relation to sentences being imposed. But I thought it would be crucial for us to have a look at the current financial year. In other words, the 2021, 2022, Q1, Q1 for us is April, May, June, versus the previous Q1 period in the 2020, 21 financial year. So currently we had 211 convicted accused in three months, which received an imprisonment of above 10 years, including life. That's a 77.6%, which uh, is also life imprisonment, 22%. So ultimately what we say here, even in this regard, we saw and we noticed that there was an improvement by the courts in imposing more severe sentences. 
I've also had a look at the femicide matters, specifically to reflect we have uh, the intimate femicide matters and non-intimate femicide matters and what the conviction rates are. We're standing at the previous uh, financial year with an 81.1%. Femicide matters, the conviction rate is immensely high. It's 97.7%. Then um, this is just purely an explanation on what I said earlier on and the importance of social context awareness, which is very crucial for any um, role play in the criminal justice sector environment. For us, it's an extensive model in our training that we provide to prosecutors so that they have a tip top understanding on the emotional impact and also the relevant syndromes that can have an impact on the success of that case being proved beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law or why the victim reacted in a particular manner. It also assists them to deal specifically with children as victims and how sometimes challenging it is to present them in a court of law and get their evidence accepted in a court of law, for instance, for many various reasons. So it focuses on that extensively. That is in addition to the protective measures that we have in law in place. The court preparation model um, is a particular model that has been designed to assist your victims when they need to testify, not only in sexual offenses matters, but in all matters when they go to court. However, at present, we, we found that 50% of these clients are specifically in relation to sexual offenses matters. I referred there to the State versus Mashlonga Supreme Court of Appeal judgment that specifically emphasized the importance of the victim impact statement, which the victim will do in his or her own writing, which can be presented in a court of law for purposes of sentencing and aggravation in sentence when ultimately you have a successful conviction in that regard. Crucial, the court preparation model and what that focus plays on how you will get a more confident and more improved witness to testify in a court of law. Of course, it's inevitable that in our environment, as many of our colleagues will know, there are certain challenges and always solutions in place. Um, of course, as I said earlier on to Dr. Judy, I don't even want to talk about the word budget because that is an ongoing battle for us to constantly ensure that we do get sufficient budget to even roll out more of these to Zera care centers. We're also now embarking on, on the private sector and the private sector has come to the board in relation to specifically in, in, in um, Limpopo, where they're going to assist us with the construction of a Tutuzela case center, which is in a mining catchment area where um, the gender-based violence in that particular area is quite rife as well. And this is what we want to explore at this stage as well, because our current TCCs are all based at government hospitals. So we want also to look at the possibility of having TCCs at, for instance, private hospitals as well. Why not? And at this stage, it must also be noted that remember your TCCs can only be based on a Department of Health or a hospital facility because of that forensic medical examination that needs to be done um, quicker rather than later. Then of course, additional specialist prosecutors always, and we're constantly busy with a recruitment drive and developing skills for those people on a constant ongoing process. Um, the success of this model and the success of GBVF stands only on us being at the collective and improved stakeholder cooperation. Without that, we will never succeed in making any differences. Then, of course, we need to constantly also for productivity improve the finalization of cases at courts. And I will talk about that later on as well. I'm close to the end of my slide, Dr. Judy, because for us, it's a crucial element, productivity from both the police side for the crucial investigations that they do, the NPA in line with the prosecutions and ultimately adjudication of cases in a court of law, and then ultimately deliver of a judgment by the judiciary. There's ongoing concerted efforts from us in in focusing on public awareness campaigns, either on virtual format or even radio talk shows, because what we notice also with the 60 days of no violence campaign from uh, that starts on 25th November to 10 December, that in that period, there's an every year 
uh, a considerable increase in matters of sexual offenses being reported at TCCs. It might be a combination of it's a festive season, more of these incidences occur, but it might also be because of the massive public awareness drives that we have, and it, it sort of like encourages people to go forward and report these matters. Then um, crucial equipment or facilities at courts to enhance specialization, always a challenging issue and always so essential. We're at this stage considering the possibility of court audio visual equipment, as it says CAVS, to be installed at TCCs, which will also minimize the secondary victimization of victims when they need to testify, when they can testify from the TCC side and not even have to go to a court as well. And then, of course, we're also part of the crucial rollout of those designated sexual offenses courts. My last slide, Dr. Judy. Um, as we all know, there are crucial pieces of legislation that's at, at the bill stage. We're talking about the amendments in relation to the criminal um, law, sexual offenses and related matters amendment. Amendment act is a bit of a, a double battle amendment, but that's what it's called the current domestic violence amendment bill to specifically look at additional services for your victims of domestic violence and specifically in relation to protection or uh, protection orders. Then currently we're also re-looking at the criminal law and related matters amendment bill in relation to the protective measures, how that can be enhanced and social development is working on the victim support services bill. And all of these processes NPA played a crucial role with other inputs or discussions in line with enhancing the services, what we ultimately want to do. Colleagues, my apologies for taking a longer time that what was allocated. I hope that this presentation you will find to be useful. Thanks, Dr. Judy. I'm done. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Advocate Pierre, uh, for that very comprehensive uh, overview. Uh, as we know, it's quite an important part of GBV, uh, though it's uh, there are so many other important parts. I just want to welcome those that uh, came uh, when we had started already. Uh, the way we'll go about it, because we have quite a few panelists, is that I'll allow each one, one of them to present and maybe pose one or two questions at the end of each one. And uh, we'll only open for questions uh, to all uh, participants at the end of uh, the panelists' presentations. But you can put your comments or questions on the chat uh, that we have. Uh, I just have one question for you, uh, Pierre, I would have loved to ask too, but let's just uh, uh, focus on one because of time. Um, I looked at the report on improving case outcomes pilot project, which raised uh, challenges when it comes to the traditional indicators to measure success uh, as problematic. And uh, you said earlier on that um, data is important because uh, it actually allows you to get uh, allocation of resources, which is true. Uh, but um, what in your view, uh, because we focusing on two traditional indicators, that is the turnaround time, which ideally should be nine months, but on average is 18 months, and also the conviction rate. What in your view would be an alternative indicator which will reward the correct behavior in tackling difficult cases? Because based on these traditional indicators, it's the view of many that people tend to drop the cases that are difficult to prove and they go for those that will give them a high conviction rate. Over to you, Advocate. Thanks, Dr. Judy, and so noted indeed. That is quite a challenging question for on various levels. It must be remembered that when we look at the environment that we are in the criminal justice sector and specifically in relation to the focus on SAPs and their expertise in relation to the investigation of cases, then for the NPA it's the prosecution of matters and then obviously for the judiciary, it's ultimately the adjudication of these cases and either bringing out a judgment which will either be a conviction or an acquittal. So for obvious reasons for us, turnaround time in relation to nine months, you are correct, crucially indicated because it assists us to determine how long these cases are on the court road. And specifically for gender-based violence and more so if children are involved, the, the quicker or in the shortest space of time cases are being finalized, 
the, the more success you might likely have ultimately in doing the justice to the prosecution of that matter. The same will go for conviction rates, because for us, as you would have noticed from my previous um, slides that I've, I've spoken about, um, the prosecution of these cases in days gone by was not at the level where it should have been. It was because of the quality of the prosecution. It was because of the knowledge and the skills. And it was also because of a lack of social context awareness training. And it was because of a lack of the level of the quality in relation to investigations. And also because of the fact that we had stumbling blocks in a court of law and case flow management that sometimes delays cases unnecessarily for in relation to having those cases being finalized. Therefore, we focus, have a concerted focus to improve that conviction rates. And unfortunately, you do, do get those prosecutors, I'll be the first to admit it, that would be very selective in taking cases to court. So therefore, we've put another process in place where we've got other additional measurement tools where a prosecutor that wants to not take a particular case to court, there should be a process where they report to their senior or supervisor as well. But coming back to your question, and I said it to you early on, for me, the burning thing is the finalization in relation to these cases in a court of law. For all of us, for the SAPs, for prosecution, for the judiciary, finalization of matters is crucial. And for me, I think it might just be the golden thread of an indicator that we should pull through. Why I'm saying that is because for obvious reasons, you can't have the same indicator for the judiciary as what you will have for us when we target prosecutions. They can't because they focus on in, in their job description as objectivity and also that their role is the adjudication and to make a decision in relation to a just judgment if there's a conviction or acquittal. But finalization of cases might be the one element that from the investigation of cases by SAPS through to the prosecution throughout the, the court of law might be a golden thread that we should maybe target and see how we can collectively focus on that to have that as an additional collective indicator for the whole criminal justice sector. I hope that answered the question, Dr. Judy. Thank you. Uh, th thanks very much, uh, Advocate Pierre. I actually want to just make one comment before I move to the next panelist. Um, uh, I actually am happy that you talking to other private sector uh, players uh, to look at increasing the number of TCCs. I actually also was quite, um, uh, it's interesting that Limpopo, according to the mining company that is asking to assist is um, seen as a hotspot. Because if I look at the hotspots, the 30 that uh, SAPS shares with us, I don't recall seeing Limpopo, Northern Cape, and Bumalanga in that list. So it just tells us again as to how we use the data and uh, the importance of the accurate data so that we can allocate resources in the right places. But uh, thanks very much, uh, Advocate Pierre, for that contribution. Uh, I'll now move on to panel number two, uh, Professor Gertrude Meander. Uh, she's a professor of gender and women's studies at uh, York University and is the director at Harriet Tubman Institute for Research on Africa and its diasporas. She holds a PhD in sociology in gender and development. And uh, she's a feminist and Africanist with research interest in gender and development, globalization, post-colonialism, and decolonialism, with a focus on Congol Congolese women. Her research focuses as well on immigration, primarily on Francophone Africans in the minority Francophone uh, community in Canada, uh, both in Toronto and Ottawa and particularly on their economic uh, and social integration. This afternoon, she'll present a case study uh, on the Pansy Foundation, which was found in Laureate, uh, Dr. Dennis, and uh, it's going to be, the case study is based on a community in the DRC. Uh, over to you, uh, Professor Gertrude.
you are muted. And if possible, if you can share your video, if you can open your video. Oh, okay. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Judith, for this warm introduction of me. And thank you to all the organizers of this workshop today. Let me first mention that I'm not reporting on behalf of any NGOs because I'm not a member of any, any NGOs. But as a scholar with interest on gender and women's, women's status in the DRC, I do research on GBV in the DRC. My own research focuses on survival of rape in Kinshasa and Bukavu, the city that was the city that has experienced war from 1998 to 2003 in the eastern part of the DRC. I examined the strategy they have developed to survive, to survive and overcome the ostracism and rejection they face in the society with the aim to develop a policy that would facilitate their integration as well as that of their children within the community. My presentation is based on the different reports that expose the situation and present the data collected on GBV in the DRC. I start with a broad overview on GBV before taking a bit, before talking a bit about the legislation or policies to combat GBV. The third point is about intervention taken by NGOs, local and international to respond to GBV and to support the victim. With the fourth point, I would like to illustrate the holistic approach to SGBV that is practiced by Penzi Foundation at Penzi Hospital. Let me start by saying that GBV can take multiple forms, whether it be physical, sexual, or psychological. In the DRC, since the war that occurred from 1998 to 2003, the magnitude of the GBV that women experienced made the, the country to be seen as the worst place for women to be in the world. This is because the DRC remains one of the countries with highest prevalence of sexual violence in the world. The armed conflict officially ended in 2003, but SGBV continues to be a common occurrence in the Eastern part of the Earth, the, uh, of the Democratic Republic of Congo. It has expanded across the country, even in the region that did not experience the war. Most of the focus is of course in the SGBV in the Eastern part, but it is important to mention the domestic violence is also high in the country. Domestic violence manifests in physical, sexual or psychological harm, including physical aggression, sexual coercion, psychological abuse and controlling behavior. SGBV includes individual rapes, gang rapes, mutilation of genital organs, sexual slavery, and forced marriages. It was widely used as weapon of war during the conflict from 1998 to 2003, but the conflict did not stop that time because we can say that the, Easter, the Eastern part of DRC is is still experiencing time to time the war. In terms of the prevalence, the prevalence of domestic violence in DRC is very prevalent 
to the point that it is considered normal. US health specialist Peterman, Palermo, and Braden Camp in the analysis that they published in 2001 based on the DRC 2007 demographic and health survey conclude that intimate partner sexual violence is the most pervasive form of violence against women in the DRC and that it occurs with extraordinary high frequency making it a particularly large problem in the DRC, especially when compared to other countries in the region. Data that was collected in 2014 revealed that since the age of 15, 50%, 52% of women have suffered physical violence and the husband or partner is cited as the author of this violence in 70, 70 in 60.5 percent of cases. 53 percent of women living with their partner have suffered acts of domestic violence, physical or sexual, and 75 percent of women find them justified. The domestic violence is not perceived in the society as an act of violence. In the DRC, 75% of women and 60% and 60 of men believe that wife beating is justifiable, is justified. So the sexual, the SGBV, not in the context of domestic violence, is the one that attracts more attention in the eastern region of the DRC and in, and in the new geographic areas in the Kasai region and Tanganyika province that have also experienced conflict in 2016. It was estimated that half a million of women were raped during the war from 1990 1998 to 2003. Other sources indicated that more than a million of women and girls were victims of sexual violence that translated by over 1,000 per day or four women raped in five minutes. That was in 2011. Sexual SGBV against women in the DRC is alarmingly widespread and more common and increasingly brutal even after the official end of the war. In 2006, in, in, in 2006 for example, 27,000 sexual assaults were recorded in the Kivu. The UN population found reported 15,000 cases of sexual violence in 2008 and 70, 17,000 in 2009. In 2011, some experts estimated that the number of women who have been raped may range from 3 million to over 3 million, 3 million, 7,000. However, it is important to mention that in the East, the, G, the SGBV is a cause of major concern, not only in the East part, but it is throughout the entire country. Numerous sources indicate that there are no accurate nationally representative numbers on the prevalence of sexual violence in the DRC because many cases are not reported. Outside of the eastern part of the DRC, it was recorded in seven, in seven provinces, including the Kinshasa, the capital of DRC, uh, 10,000 cases of SGBV, including rape in 2011, and 15,000 in 2012. 
Overall, there were 18,000 cases of SGBV in 2012 in seven provinces. Of this number, the city of Kinshasa had the most rape and sexual assault. Most of the victims of these rapes are generally young underage girls between the ages of 12 and, seven, and 17. In terms of the legislation, there is not too much to say because uh, of domestic violence, spousal rape is not prosecutable offense. Even custom does not recognize domestic rape. It is very rare for women to report domestic violence. Many women do not know that conjugal sexual violence is illegal and that they are, can report, they can report it. Only a small proportion of women who have experienced sexual abuse seek treatment or report the crime. As for the SGBV, not in the context of domestic violence, the, there is the 2006 constitution is considered as positive because the government's commitment to eliminate all forms of discrimination against women and to, and to combat all forms of violence against women in the public and private sphere. However, there is no mention of domestic violence in the DRC penal code. That was amended in 2006, six, in 2006, or its family code that was amended in 2003 and 2016. There is also a legislation that the government adopted uh, as a national strategy to combat SGBV. Beside that, no other legislation uh, that is intended to protect women. In terms of access to justice, justice for victims of sexual and domestic violence is difficult to achieve because of a culture of impunity within the Congolese justice system, st stating that police, prosecutor, and judges are corrupted, are corrupt. A lack of institutional resources or capacity may be a barrier to justice. Now, NGOs has responded or have intervened to support women. There are many local and international NGOs that work in collaboration to bring end to SG, SGBV. They work on identifying victims of sexual violence, but it's not an easy task because many cases are not being reported. The intervention depends on the provincial context. It has been argued that there is no reliable mapping of services for victims of sexual violence, but that collect collections, collection and identification have facilitated NGOs to provide support to the victim. Based on data collected, several organizations in the eastern part of the, of the DRC provide medical social service. Pansy Hospital also provides gynecological care to women with rape-related injuries. Some NGOs offer legal advice in South Kivu and operate temporarily mobile courts that are set up in remote areas to increase access to judicial system. However, there are vast territories in the country with little or no service at all. In Kasai region, for example, the data collected a demographic and health survey and the analysis of the overall situation of GBV and their line major problems. The child marriage, sexual violence in Tibet, partner violence. 
while, AG, while NGOs may focus on one or two aspects, such as medical care or social services, there are some that provide a holistic, holistic intervention. The, the Pansy Foundation is one example that is well known. Pansy Fond uh, uh, from 1992 to 2018, 55,000 survivors of rape were treated at Pansy Hospital. Among these, 41,000 suffer with gynecological pathologies, including genital fistula. In 2006, the UN reported that 1,000 of 40 of 4,000 raped women who underwent surgery at Pansy were women with fistula. The survivors of sexual violence in conflict have access to medical, psychological, legal, and socioeconomic support in one place. That is the part, the most part of holistic approach of Pansy. In the existing hospital, they follow a personalized healing path and receive all the care they need. This holistic approach at Pansy Hospital ensures that the system is sustainable and survivors have access to the care they need at one place. The holistic approach combines four pillars. The medical pillars, the psychosocial pillar, the socioeconomic reintegration pillar, and the legal pillar. The Pansy Foundation has recently published the activity of the psychological pillar for the July month of 2021. For example, the case of 416 patients, including individuals, among the case examined, the patients that were registered for psychosocial care were taken in charge for appropriate care. The example of those patients include of those 14, uh, 416 patients, including 2,700 women and 16 men and 127 children benefited from psychosocial follow-ups at home in their community is illustrative of the holistic approach. Family sessions were added to the care process and were carried out at the end of the different mission. This improved the family reintegration of survivors who were stigmatized and rejected by their families. For children born, born of rape, for example, psychoeducational sessions were organized for the parents and guardians of children's beneficiaries of the children of Pansy Project and well elsewhere on family integration and non-stigmatization of children born of rape. Okay. Um, the legal pillar receive requests from legal assistance and entrusts the case for lawyers who draft complaints and provide legal follow-up. The pillar also does, does community outreach and radio broadcast. The economic support, such as vocational training, enables survivors of sexual violence to reintegrate in society. It also involves supporting survivors and their children to continue their education. Training on topics such as reproductive health, household maintenance, literacy, numeracy, marketing, negotiation technique, and leadership is also given to survivors. The holistic approach ensures that sustainable change or transformation should uh, occur. Altogether, the pillar ensure the well-being of individuals and benefit society as survivors 
return to contribute to the society and the economic. But even if the model is well organized, they face some challenges that are interconnected, like poverty. Because of the poverty, it is difficult for individuals to access to health care. Access to health care, there is a lack of infrastructure, such as transportation, which makes it difficult for individu individual to get access to health care too. Lack of health infrastructure. That is not for the holistic model, but I'm talking here in general for uh, the DRC. So the, the, the access to the justice, the court system is in pieces and that police have no money or training. Formal legal mechanisms in rural areas are virtually not existent. There are not enough courts in Kivu region, for example, um, meaning that women must travel distances of up to 400 kilometers to access the, the health care. Informal settlements known as arrangements, à l'amiable, amical arrangements are used to resolve sexual violence cases. These informal settlements are a traditional practice that occasionally take place against the will of the woman. Victims' inability to pay for legal service and procedure has also been identified as an obstacle. That is why the approach practice at Panzi Hospital is so helpful because they have support and the survivors are being accompanied in all steps. But there are still so many cases where justice is not seen to be done that there's few su successful prosecution are failing to shift the common perceptions over the lack of justice in sexual violence case in the DRC. And the, the culture of impunity doesn't help the survivor to overcome the situation. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Gaytrud. Uh, thanks very much uh, for painting a, a very clear picture. Concerning as it is, uh, we do have uh, similar challenges in this country. Um, though um, the Domestic Violence Act uh, in this country uh, has now taken a different view in terms of uh, a husband uh, being able to be uh, seen as, as, I mean, a, a rapist as opposed to where it's at, at the DRC. Um, I'm impressed with uh, the Ponzi uh, Foundation, in, including the pillar on uh, economic support, uh, helping survivors and also education of the survivors' kids and uh, the, the survivors. Uh, because of time, uh, I would move on to Nechama. Thanks again, uh, Gertrude. Uh, I noticed that the challenge of limitation of data uh, is universal. Um, if uh, I listen to the statistic that you give, uh, when you mention age, uh, something says to me that you might have a similar problem to us amongst others when it comes to uh, data. In this country, we find that it's women of the reproductive age uh, whose cases are reported on in the media especially, and uh, it neglects uh, people that are outside that age, amongst other many challenges uh, when it comes to data and reporting of GBV um, cases. Um, I'd like to move to Dr. Nehama Brody, uh, our next uh, panelist. Uh, Dr. Nehama is a veteran journalist and the author of nine books, including Femicide in South Africa. She is former head of training and research at independent fast-checking 
uh, sorry, fact checking organization Africa Check uh, and holds a PhD in journalism from the University of Witts, uh, where she is also a lecturer. Her research work focuses on data collection and fatal violence in the global South. Uh, I think she, in her book, uh, Femicide in South Africa, she is actually compiled a data. I, I stand to be corrected, but I think uh, the largest in the world when it comes to femicide uh, database. She'll talk about the limitations of data and the limitations of what she calls so-called AI and big data in understanding or working to reduce uh, gender-based violence. Thanks very much, uh, Nehama. I've enjoyed engaging with you in the past few days. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Lamini. I'm just setting my timer there. Let me quickly introduce myself and my work to everybody who's attending. So I, and my background is as a journalist, but I've spent most of the last decade building, integrating and analyzing available data about femicide in particular, which I've now expanded to working with uh, all forms of fatal violence uh, in South, well, uh, yeah, fatal, fatal violence in South Africa. But I want to say from the outset that my work builds off the work of a number of other people um, who have been building, making, and working with this data for years. And those include people at the Medical Research Council um, and at various other organizations, the Institute for Security Studies. And some of these people are Naima Abrams, Shanaz Matthews, Lisa Vetten, Richard Metopoulos, Brett Bowman, Lorna Martin. So I really stand on the shoulders of the work that came before me. Um, Globally and in South Africa, we have a challenge in terms of gathering data about gender-based violence and femicide. We don't actually have very good data, and people seem to think this is a South African phenomenon, but it's actually a global problem. Um, and this really starts with us uh, understanding what is the definition of gender-based violence and femicide. Um, it's something that many people might assume is universal and universally understood, but this isn't the case. And I think that the previous speaker really emphasized that where you know, different countries might have different laws, they might have different definitions. Um, so e you know, even with femicide, the definition in some countries is a woman who is killed for being a woman by a man. Um, which is almost impossible to sort of operationalize from a legal framework, but it makes it very challenging to collect uh, equal data about even femicide, which is, I think, the easiest of all of the terms that fall broadly under this kind of anomalous gender-based violence. Uh, so even femicide is difficult. And data collection is erratic, not just in South Africa, but globally. The terms are ambiguous. The terms are changing constantly. The terms are unevenly applied. Also, when we look at global data collection, we typically have more data from the states that are able to collect data. And this would be what I would refer to as the global north, mostly. Um, and this creates an imbalance of how we, we know what we think we know about crime, about violence, and about murder, um, where the whole knowledge system that tells us how to know what we know is, in fact, often based on underrepresentation of many regions, particularly underrepresentation of the global south. In South Africa, we also have additional historical issues with the collection and annotation of data about violence, where we had a state that for many years didn't really bother much to collect or gather much details about, about uh, violence that happened to black people, except for political violence, which predominantly happened to men. So data about violence that happened to black women is quite thin during that time. And this legacy has really been perpetuated, continues today. Um, we also have to deal with, like many countries, multiple different state organizations that produce and expect sometimes differing forms of data. Um, they might rely on different methods to obtain their data or to capture their data or to share their data. For example, we have data from the police services. We have data from the Department of Health and death notices. We have data from Statistics South Africa. We have surveys. We have the Justice Department. So where do all these come from and how do they integrate? Beyond that, we also have to understand that what is reported to the police or what we are able to capture as data is not the same as the crimes that actually take place. Um, and with gender-based violence, which as I've said, is, is not really a well-defined term. We think we know what it means, but what does it really mean? Uh, maybe we should default to saying violence against women and violence against children. I'm not really sure. 
But even there, we know that many people don't report these crimes. Maybe they don't trust the police services or they don't believe that anything will be done if they report the crime. Um, maybe it's not safe for them to report the crime because they're in a controlling or a vulnerable situation where their intimate partner or even their family members are restricting their freedom of movement. Um, they may not even be aware that they're victims of violence. Um, as uh, Prof. Meander mentioned in, in her talk previously, some women might not consider that being raped by a husband is in fact a crime because they've just expected that that is how things are. So we know that uh, you know, the quality of data about gender-based violence and even about femicide varies quite dramatically within our own country and globally. But understanding the problem of violence against women and violence against children is really not just about data itself. And that's where I wanted to sort of spend the last half of my section talking about big data and AI. Um, so I also wanted to go into definitions here because this is always important for me. Um, uh, as the name implies, big data is often meaning just lots of data or lots of data points, perhaps where it's inefficient or it's impractical or it's impossible to process the data manually or get any sort of meaningful results uh, in a manual way or through standard or what used to be standard computational processes. Um, for example, if we're dealing with data around the human genome, we need a big computer, we need a lot of processing power to actually work through lots and lots of data. Uh, big data processes may also mean or imply uh, studying metadata about the information that we obtain or allowing us to see connections between different data in a way that wouldn't otherwise be visible or accessible to us. A little bit like uh, being able to see one of those geoglyphs from the air if you were sort of flying in a drone or something. Um, and I want to note that I think the dashboard that's going to be shared later is not an example of AI or big data. It's an example of data visualization, which is something that's completely different. Um, now, I just back to the definitions around big data and AI. So to process big data and sometimes not so big data or medium sized data, we often use problem solving instructions that are called algorithms for a computer. And the term artificial intelligence, I find is sometimes a little bit of a misnomer because it isn't real intelligence. It's just doing what the algorithms or what we tell it to. But what we can do is we can take data and algor algorithms that are problem solving instructions, put them together, and we can use them to train computers or computational processes to imitate the way that humans learn sometimes. This can be feel a little bit like intelligence. And this can gradually improve the accuracy of the computer. And this we would call machine learning. Now, machine learning approaches, usually you, they need to be trained. So you have to train the computer or the process on certain data sets. And these data sets might be called a corpus. So a corpus is a selected, relevant and representational data set. Now, it's been apparent for quite some time for those of you that follow sort of machine learning and AI, that um, tech, machine learning and big data have some problems uh, as a community. So the human side of it have some problems in terms of specifically race and misogyny. Um, so we know, for example, that certain early machine learning facial recognition programs were unable to detect black faces or that they mislabeled black subjects as apes in photographs. And that's because the training data that was supplied to them was mostly white people because the texts that were writing the algorithms were mostly white people. We also know that early vo voice recognition software uh, was not unable to detect female voices unless they lowered their voices because uh, also they wasn't able to detect female voices as human voices because once again, it was trained on predominantly male voices, which represented the tech team that had put the, uh, the algorithms or the machine learning sets together. And um, one of the authors that I'm going to talk about a bit later, Abeba Birhan, she notes that how algorithmic tools embed and perpetuate societal and historical biases and injustices. There are a number of important and interesting female authors that I think people should read about algorithmic bias and about al algorithmic ethics. That includes Safia Noble, Kathy O'Neill, Abeba Biran and uh, Timnit Gebru. Um, so you should definitely read all of those. I'll post the names in the chat a little bit later. So, um, you know, at that point, it's important to note that the team that's developing this dashboard and stuff so far is all male. And I think these are issues that we need to question, we need to raise, we need to be transparent about as we explore what is the potential role of uh, machine learning and algorithmic approaches to the types of data we have available. Um, so there is also um, at the moment a sort of a trend to try and find technical solutions 
to all of our social problems. And some people refer to this as solutionism. Um, there's a shift as well in bureaucratic circles towards algorithmic governance. And in criminal justice uh, context, this includes things like crime prediction software or predictive policing, which sounds a bit like a science fiction movie and works about as well as one. Um, there are gunshot detection systems. There are programs that are used to calculate everything from how much bail a prisoner should, should pay to the likelihood that the prisoner will, will re-offend, so their, their potential for recidivism. Um, and most of these, well, many of these have produced very problematic results. You can go and look up a few years ago, ProPublica did an investigation of a recidivism algorithm that was used to calculate somebody's likelihood of reoffending and found out that it was extremely racist. It wasn't programmed to be, it just was. Um, there's been recent reports about gunshot detection software that wasn't working. Well, it was working, but it wasn't working in the way I suppose it'd been planned. And it was used as a retrospective justification to go and shoot unarmed or you know, unthreatening black males who were in the area where the gunshots had allegedly been detected in the States. So all of these need to be considered. Um, there's a scholar called Alesha Zavriznik who says that when he's writing about algorithmic justice, using algorithms in the context of crime and policing isn't always driven by the public interest. It's often driven by market interests or by what the developers believe is relevant. And he also notes that Algorithms are appealing to corporations, to governments and to states because they promise to shrink budgets, to maximize the use of resources, to reduce an overload of cases. And they might also diffuse the individual burden of having to make a difficult decision, maybe sentencing a prisoner. So we don't have to blame a person, we can now blame the machine. And there's also this assumption that algorithms are somehow free of human bias, even though they're very much human artifacts. Um, the problem is that when technology produces unfair or discriminatory outcomes, um, Abeba Berhan and her uh, co-author Fred Cummings write that it's often treated as a side effect that requires a further technical solution. So the, to resolve bad tech, you add more tech or you add another algorithm instead of considering that these are problems with fundamentally and flawed, deep rooted underlying assumptions. Um, and one of these assumptions is that we can generate knowledge from simply data without any a priori knowledge of the problem. And, and I think that's a, a flawed approach that we need to, to constantly reconsider. We also need to understand how do these, how do predictive AI models work using data? So a number of predictive policing models, for example, have been developed on things that have nothing to do with violence. A predictive policing model in, a, in America was developed using an earthquake model. Um, in South Africa, I think the dashboard that we're looking at now was based off work done uh, dealing with data from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Now, while we talk about violence in epidemiological terms, we need to understand that violence doesn't behave like an infectious disease and we have to understand it differently. And we have to ask ourselves, what matters rather than what does the data measure? And there are two key questions that I'm gonna finish with uh, discussing. The first relates to the data itself and the second relates to the algorithm. We need to think about the data that we're using. What is the quality of this data? How is this data being collected? How is the data being cleaned? How is it being prepared? If data about gender-based violence and femicide is already relatively poor quality, simply having more of it isn't going to help. It's that old concept of garbage in, garbage out. Secondly, I think on a broader perspective, we need to consider the ethics of collecting this type of data. Um, we're gonna be gathering data from people who are already vulnerable, um, where access to a phone or a computer may be restricted and where sharing data may even put them at greater risk. So I know people continually confer to this, uh, refer to the shadow pandemic that was occurring during COVID and during lockdown, but there are cases where even accessing a web page on a computer can put a victim of violence at much greater risk of further violence. We need to consider that. Um, we also need to consider the ethics of who owns this data and what happens to this data in the future. I mean, let's think on a bio perspective of Henrietta Lacks and who owned her data. Um, and what will this data be used for? Will it be used to inform police responses, justice responses, and those sorts of things? Will this type of data be used to create the notion of a suspect before anybody even enters the criminal justice system or is even charged with a crime? The second thing we need to consider is the use of algorithms. It's not enough just to have better algorithms. We need to understand the problem of violence much better. Algorithms as they are practiced and shared now are often black box. That means the, the kind of the computational side is either not shared or not understood. We don't always know how they work and we need to move towards transparency and away from opacity. We also need to think about how we determine whether an algorithm 
uh, approach is successful or fair and who decides what is a success and what is fair. For example, we might have different ways of measuring that. If an algorithm has an equal number of false positives and false negatives, by which we mean an innocent person gets convicted and a guilty person gets set free, is that considered fair? Is that the kind of fairness that we want to approach? I'm going to end with a note from Abeba Biran and uh, Fred Cummings, where they remind us that algorithms, as they are currently used, they create and sustain a certain social and moral order. Um, we need to remind ourselves that concepts like bias, fairness, and justice are moving targets. They are not set in stone. And we need to emphasize understanding rather than prediction. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Nehama. As I've learned uh, over the past few days, uh, you always give thought-provoking and very important perspective to things, and I admire that. Um, yes, you are so correct. Who is uh, in the team that develops the dashboards and everything else? That's very critical, uh, especially everywhere actually, but especially in our country. Uh, those are the things that uh, we need to address and will address. And uh, thanks for giving the, you know, the analysis, uh, the definitions, uh, because it's not everyone who's familiar with the different terms and what they mean. And uh, I actually am happy that you've raised all these very important points that I can name one by one. I'll now move to uh, Dr. Tomiwa, who brings a, a different perspective, uh, but uh, I'm sure the participants will agree with me that uh, we've been very lucky to have people that bring a very diverse view of things uh, who are actually specialists in their own field. So I'll ask um, Dr. Tomiwa, Erin Osho, who is the Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of uh, Town Talk Solutions Incorporated, a data intelligence company building AI and data science solutions using location-specific data. Town Talk uh, captures hard to collect data using scalable technology tools and develops solutions that help to improve safety and security for individuals businesses and governments. Recently, Town Talk was co-awarded the Global South A14 COVID response project alongside the Social Science Academy of Nigeria to de deploy its technology tools and artificial intelligence to mitigate gender-based violence and re uh, related insecurities faced by women in Nigeria. Uh, notably, Tomiwa serves as the project's Principal Investigator. Uh, over to you, uh, Tomiwa. Um, you're still on mute. All right. <clears throat> thank there you. you go. Judy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, being part of this webinar. Uh, so today I'll just be speaking on mitigating gender-based violence in the Nigerian context, apply technology or AI or not. Um, and I'll be speaking in the context of Project SAFE, which is a project in Nigeria aiming to create safer communities for women. It's been implemented by the Social Science Academy of Nigeria and Town Talk, uh, which is a data intelligence company with support from IDRC and CEDA. So just to give a bit of context um, on gender-based violence in, uh, in Nigeria, uh, let's take a person called Safi, who is a manager in a multinational company. Uh, she's been working from home uh, due to COVID, and, but her husband has recently lost his job and has become physically abusive at home. Uh, what are Safi's options? What should she do? Well, Safi can endure, uh, but her productivity will decline at work. She could report, but the police may not understand her as with many of the existing physical channels. Or she could seek support, and the biggest problem we, find, we face locally is that um, there's a big cultural stigma around seeking support for issues around of gender-based violence, particularly when you're married, in fact. So this problem is a lot bigger than just Safi. One in three women in Nigeria have experienced uh, gender-based violence, um, and this was pre-pandemic numbers. 
This amounts to more than 30 million women. Um, reported cases of gender-based violence um, in Nigeria during the pandemic um, lockdown months, uh, that's March and April 2020, uh, increased between 149 to 297% um, across the country, uh, in particular in places like Lagos. But these numbers are still critically low um, in the grand scheme of things. So we think that the 170 million mobile phone subscribers in Nigeria pre present an opportunity to harness big data, AI, or technology in general. But I think as Nekema, um, Dr. Nekema um, mentioned, big data, AI, and technology can be very dangerous um, for a number of reasons, which I will not go into detail because she has done justice to that. But key around the chief amount among the issues include privacy, um, privacy, the sensitivity of, of security of the sensitive data, um, which is being collected. Uh, big data on fragmented small data is problematic because you could be reaching very, very disastrous um, uh, conclusions, biased conclusions. For example, um, predicting the, that the woman's face looks like a um, is an ape or the voice of a man is, uh, is you know, something else. Um, and there are a whole range of ethical concerns um, that uh, that arise as a result of using uh, AI technology or big data to make informed decisions, particularly with respect to a sensitive social problem like gender-based violence. But that said, with all the limitations of big data, AI, and technology, um, we also believe that big data and AI and technology also has significant advantages. And I'll go on to just speak a bit about the advantages um, and how we are applying it in the context of Project SAFE. But to do so, to understand how AI should be used, we have to understand the multi-stakeholder value chain. And we have to have something in mind that one size fits all AI cannot be used, cannot be applied to mitigate gender-based violence. It, the solutions need to be specific to the different stakeholders, which include individuals, that is understanding how to increase reporting, um, support providers such as the NGOs and state service providers, how to better coordinate response, and for Policymakers is how to better leverage the fragmented data that we have today. I'll now go into just a bit um, about each of the different stakeholders and outline really for each of them, for example, the individuals, how, what are the specific challenges? So for individuals, the challenges are three pronged. Um, we have reporting stigmatized incidents because of the stigma associated with it, accessing real time information around safety and security, and in particular, especially look, um, you know, being able to get location-based emergency support. In the context of Nigeria, there is currently no um, centralized 911 line that is functional. So every uh, location, every emergency support prov provider is almost location specific and it's almost difficult to be able to find the, you know, the contact details. So in order to apply AI to, to this type, to address this type of uh, solution at this at the level of individuals, we need to be able to have some key considerations such as understanding um, how to address stigma, um, address, um, understanding the issues around economic and social inequalities that prevent people from accessing um, these technologies, for example, or even benefiting from it. And in the case of, um, sorry, and in the case of um, individ for individuals, we want to apply inclusive technologies that, for example, address these inequalities, like applying an internet-free mobile application or even um, USSD to enable people um, uh, you know, that don't have smartphones also benefit. Or even um, being able to have inclusivity of language. For example, in Nigeria, we're able to um, apply our USSD in five local languages. And particularly being able to bridge the data gap around being, uh, being able to access locations-based emergency contacts. And in fact, being able to protect the identity of, uh, of the individual as they're accessing this um, uh, emergency contact, and maybe in some cases, interactive voice recording or response. For support providers such as NGOs and um, the state service providers, uh, as well as um, including the family support units, legal, and a whole range of other support prov providers, getting credible intelligence, information sharing, and response coordination are some of the major challenges being faced, and in particular, the response coordination because of the limited resources and the need to consolidate resources to be able to have the highest level of impact. The key consideration here is that we have to, we want and we hope that, and we assume that the um, support providers are willing to connect with survivors through the technology tools. And our, our approach to this is 
to include the stakeholders um, in product development, for example, the integrated case management platform that we are deploying on Project Safe, and also to look at uh, issues around mitigating risk, like privacy by design, ensuring that only the right people have access to the um, right uh, information on the platform, or even being specific as to the type of support. For example, knowing that you are providing psychosocial support and you know where the limit of it is. However, because gender-based violence can sometimes be complex, um, the survivors may want financial support over and beyond psychosocial support in some cases in the context of Nigeria. And then for policymakers, um, we have challenges such as access to data, monitoring location-based threats, and predicting high-risk areas. Now, the key consideration here is that the policymakers need to have the political will to um, use the evidence from, for program design and policy design. And so our approach here is to have um, exchange engagement with stakeholders, for example, what is being done today, um, where you have you've built a dashboard for visualization and you're sharing with the stakeholders to appreciate the process. Um, you have resource engagement, such as webinars, again, similar to today, but also in terms of resource engagement, inviting members of uh, the, of the, of the, of the, uh, of, of the critical stakeholders, like the government to be part of uh, this webinars to discuss how the government, for example, is moving towards a much more data-driven approach. And of course, very importantly, we want to understand the multi-pronged um, advocacy and lobbying that is required to achieve policy change. So uh, I'll just conclude very quickly with this last two slides that just uh, by just laying out um, what we are doing in Project Safe um, at a very high level. Um, and from what we are doing, um, there are two real platforms, there are two sides to the coin. Um, there is the crowdsourcing channels, um, which um, help us to reach the most vulnerable in society. Um, we have three crowdsourcing channels. We have the USSD that allows us to uh, enable us to beneficiaries to request callback, share unpleasant experiences, register with the project. Uh, we have two online channels, um, such as the, um, the mobile app that allows you to access location-based contact in a right dignity-protecting manner, as well as you know, through social media um, channels to help to reach us. And then we have offline channels such as the toll-free line, um, getting um, emergency records or recruiting people from emergency records, um, direct and community-based organizations. All this data is fed into a data management tool. And from this data management tool, it's an intelligent tool that is able to now start making, for example, outbound calls automatically to um, our survivors using interactive voice response system. Um, and then giving um, our survivors, our beneficiaries, the um, option of selecting the types of um, options and supports they would require. And then this gets fed to a trained uh, psychosocial support specialist within our specialist support hub, who then um, are able to handle some of these cases internally in a dignity protecting way. All this process initially um, is able to take away some of the stigma associated with um, not reporting because you know, it's almost technology, you're engaging with technology as well as now with human beings. And in situations where you know, we, the, the support that is required exceeds what we are able to provide internally, we're able to then pass our survivors on to our third party support partners who again have engaged with the project and are doing all this within the platform of the project. And again, of course, for those that don't want to get passed on to the support providers, we're able to have intelligent ways of using interactive voice response to check on them on, regular, on a regular basis and then have internal review of, the, um, of their responses um, in order to you know, have an opportunity to follow up. The idea here is that we are able to bring both the individuals, the support providers, as well as um, the critical stakeholders onto the same platform. And all of this can now be visualized in a meaningful way. You know, we can derive algorithms from, from, uh, from this uh, insight that can now be presented to, um, to, the, to the critical stakeholders like um, the, the government or the policymakers. And lastly, I'll just um, talk about uh, where, what we have done so far um, on Project Safe. It's still very early days. Um, however, um, I will just speak about the fact that we're in the two states we have reached in the pilot. We have reached about 3,000 plus people in two states in Nigeria. Um, data has been has cut across a wide demographic, but mostly 90% um, women. Um, most of the, the people, uh, our beneficiaries so far prefer the use of USSD and voice calls over 70% even um, above and beyond using mobile application. And I think that speaks to the local context, the fact that most people don't have smartphones. Um, from our data, as I mentioned, we have all our tools in multiple languages, five of the most common languages. 
And it's clear that the completion rate of reporting and engagement is significantly higher in the local languages over English. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, access to some financial support um, sometimes is significantly preferred, even over um, psychosocial support offering of, of the project. And I think, again, that speaks to the local context we have um, in Nigeria um, around this fine, um, economic situation we have. And of course, analysis is still ongoing to compare digital reporting with and the engagement of survivors with the fiscal channel. But I think if you um, go to projectsafe.ng, we'll constantly be updating um, some of the insights we are deriving from, uh, from our report. And if you want to also have a look at the, some of the tools that we have built um, that, are, that connect with the grassroots, please visit the website. And I'm happy to answer any questions and connect with anyone to discuss further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tomiwa. Uh, I realize uh, that we only have 20 minutes and uh, thanks very much. I know you went very quickly, uh, mindful of the time. And uh, it's quite a good perspective that you've given us uh, where you are actually using uh, AI to try and solve a challenge that is big uh, in Nigeria. I like that you are mindful of being inclusive uh, just looking at the languages and the different uh, tools that you use. Uh, looking at where we are, uh, I'm happy and grateful to our panelists uh, that have actually given us a very broad uh, overview. Uh, we've seen a, a bit of what is happening in South Africa, a portion of it uh, through TCCs, uh, some portion of DRC and what a Panzer Foundation is doing over and above just uh, the context within its doing what, what it's doing, and also what uh, you are doing, uh, uh, Dr. Tomio, and uh, I really appreciate that. I, as um, a representative of the fund, I am quite keen that we engage. Uh, we didn't come here uh, to only um, tell you. Uh, our perspective, uh, but also to engage with you. Uh, I'm very happy that we had a different, uh, very informative and also important perspective uh, from Dr. Nehama Brody. Uh, Barry has posted uh, the link uh, that will take you to where the recording will be, uh, but also it will give you an opportunity uh, to raise uh, your voice in terms of uh, what you would like clarified, your input, uh, intervention that you think is important. But uh, I would now like to open it uh, to, to the floor uh, based on the timing. The dashboard that uh, Nehama was talking about, it's a lot of work that has been initiated uh, by Benjamin and uh, Fifi. Uh, but it is at its inception. Uh, so it, it, it was quite good that we just show that we have started something, uh, but um, I think taking a judgment call from where I am, I think I would like more input from the floor and uh, leave out uh, the dashboard for this uh, engagement. And uh, I do promise that we will have uh, different engagements at different times uh, because we do want to come up with solutions, uh, which is why I would really like that when you give the input on the website uh, using the link, uh, it's solutions-based. We can all come up with what we're not doing right, what's right and what's wrong, but it's very important that our way of looking at this is solutions-based. Uh, as a fund, we look forward to working with Dr. Mbumi Zungu and Sips Mtembu from the Pillar 6 uh, MCP uh, to actually grow this to what we are trying to achieve. What are we trying to achieve with the dashboard? We need accurate data for us to have interventions that are focused in the right place 
at the right time. It's important for resource allocation as indicated by Advocate Pierre. We need to know how big the, the size of the problem is for us to be able to invest enough resources, not just financial, financial and also human resources to address the challenge. So accurate data is very, very important. Uh, I'll now uh, give you an opportunity to raise your hand, uh, make a comment or ask a question. Um, I'll just ask while I'm waiting for you to come through, I'll ask uh, Barry to read out any questions that have not been answered on the chat box. Over to you, please, Barry. Uh, thank you, Judy. Um, there there uh, was a question that I think was picked up in the chat, but the question about the um, uh, the um, um, uh, centers that was actually raised um, to to uh, to talk about whether it um, there are interpreters for people that are deaf. Could that be or uh, people that are hear hearing impaired? Could uh, that be uh, just quickly touched on? Uh, thanks very much, Barry. Advocate Pierre, um, did we respond to that uh, question which said uh, they understand 98% of the TCCs don't have interpreters for people with hearing impairment? Thanks, Dr. Judy. Yes, I've responded to the question just in a nutshell. I've indicated that we're busy with an efficacy review specifically of the services as provided at the TCC site. And it is correct to say that definitely not, most of the sites do not have services available for hearing impaired, but there are sites, limited though, that do get assistance from NGOs where that service is available in certain areas. So we are looking into that process to upbeat that service ultimately. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Advocate Pierre. I must say, having been to one or two of the TCCs, uh, I just want to thank the NGOs that help. Uh, it is a true collaboration, a multi-sectorial collaboration, not only multi-departmental, and uh, we appreciate the work that is provided by the NGOs. Any other question, Barry, that hasn't been addressed? Um, uh, there's a question about... Um... It um, says that um, South Africa's combination of RICA requirements for SIM cards and the newish Poppy Act uh, helps to tackle um, the um, a question of security of information and the safety of callers. And a question whether there is anything similar in um, Nigeria in uh, terms of the apps that, that we're looking at there. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Barry. Tamiwa? Can you repeat that, please? Is there what in Nigeria? Okay, there's, um, there are, in fact, various laws in South Africa. There's RICA, which is what people have to, to give when they are registering a SIM card, which gives personal information, linking them to the SIM card. There's the Protection of Personal Information Act, that's uh, just recently come in in South Africa, which 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 also gives uh, protection. And the, the question was asking if there is anything similar currently um, there or or in the pipeline in Nigeria. Oh, great! No, thank you, uh, uh, Barry. I had answered that question in the chat box, but yes, um, there's um, there's something there's similar um, policies and programs. Um, Rika, as you mentioned, um, is we, you have to give up your personal information, in fact, your biometrics and a whole range of things too, before you can register, before you can get a SIM card uh, in Nigeria. Um, there are also other uh, programs um, such as the NDPR, the Nigerian Data Protection Regulation, that governs how you use um, the, data, the data, what type of data you can collect. Um, and how you can transfer, destroy, store, and all the um, everything across the um, data life cycle. Uh, the problem, uh, you, and also there are other programs like you know being able to track um, uh, malicious activities using, for example, cell phones. Uh, it, with respect to the last point around tracking uh, behavior, particularly for non-smartphone users, 
um, it's a bit challenging because there's a whole process. Only the Department of State Security, for example, is able to um, enforce or get the telecommunication providers um, to provide this, uh, provide this information um, for non-smartphone users. Um, and with respect to, um, to uh, the equivalent of RICA, which is uh, getting personal information, that has been duly enforced. In fact, uh, for uh, MTN got into trouble um, in Nigeria for not enforcing it, but now everyone is doing it, so it's almost the norm. Um, and with respect to areas around issues around um, protection, privacy, that's still an area that requires a lot of work. Um, yes, the policy is there, but implementing and enforcing the policy um, is still challenging. There's a lot of capacity that needs to be built up in that area, um, and I think um, it's, given the framework exists. Um, it will be work in progress um, to to um, to as we, as we go along, and particularly with respect to how it is um, applied in sensitive social uh, to sensitive social problems like um, gender-based violence or even healthcare data. Um, I think that's an area that still requires a bit of work, particularly around enforcement. But yeah, that's 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 about it. I hope I was able to answer your questions. Thank you. And then I see um, there's a question. A person's hand is up, uh, Dr. Numpumule. Good afternoon, colleagues. I, I hope you can hear me. Um, yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Judy. I have uh, a, a question for, uh, for Pierre, and it's in connection with um, just trying to find out if they, as the department first, as the NPA, have their own dashboard. I mean, he talked about the the the, the the uh, you've muted uh, Dr. Mbomi. Oh, apologies. Um, I was saying that I would like to, to pose a question to, to Pierre with regards to um, a dashboard, if they, as the NPA, have their own dashboard, which is used to track um, the cases, as he was explaining, you know, the, the time that it takes from the time that uh, cases are reported and going through the system to the time of conviction. If there's that dashboard and how that dashboard would then interface with what we want to do. That's, that's the first question that I have. And then the second question, I guess I'm, I'm posing it to the colleagues uh, who have shared their case studies from different countries. How are they dealing with the, the problem of double counting in the space of GBV in that a person can, can, can present in different places, but it's still the same person. And if you're going to use that data, there is a danger that you'll then double count those people. So how do they make sure that they clean the data? Do they have maybe unique uh, ways of identifying a person and being able to track them along the the, the, the different you know, um, service providers or processes that a person who has survived gender-based violence uh, might, might, might go through. And then finally, uh, Dr. Judy, it's just an appeal that as we, as, we, as we move forward, it would be good for us to, to make sure that on the table we've got different um, stakeholders. And, and here I would really like to appeal that we make sure that, it, yes, it's a technical um, stage in terms of developing what you want to do, but make sure that we have voices of, of, of survivors within this process and making sure that civil society continues to be a critical part of what we want to do and it just doesn't become um, academics and, and some of us who are working in the research space so that we balance what we are doing with some of the needs that are out there and the experiences. Thank you so much. Thanks very much for that input, uh, Dr. Mbomi. Before I hand over to Pierre to answer your first question, uh, I just want to endorse what you've said. Uh, this was just the first uh, workshop, and uh, as indicated earlier, uh, I would like us to take it forward from here uh, with you um, within Pillar 6 uh, MSP, sorry, MCP, and uh, we'll definitely address uh, the issue of uh, different stakeholders uh, because as indicated, uh, the survivors are very important. Civil society is very important. A multi-stakeholder approach is what will take us far and will have a sustainable uh, result if we do that. Thanks for that input. Can I ask uh, Advocate Pierre to come in? The first question was if you have 
a, a dashboard um, as uh, the NPA? Thank you, Dr. Judy, and thank you for the question, Dr. Nomfrey. Um, no, we don't have a dashboard to the extent that it's comprehensive as it should be. What we do have, we've got a process that all sexual offence matters that are being dealt with in a court, either if they are parted or nolly prosecute or being prosecuted, and what the status of the prosecution is in relation to it being postponed or it being finalized with a verdict, that information is submitted on a monthly basis to us with the conviction rates in including. What we've done for the TCC is to take it a step further. And that step further that we took was to specifically look into what the value of those cases are in relation to the sentences that are being imposed by the courts to, in other words, for us to have an analysis in relation to how many of the offenders receive life imprisonment sentences or 20 to, 20 to 25 years imprisonment or 10 to 19 years imprisonment as prescribed by the Minimum Sentences Act. Currently, the, uh, the department is, is, is working on and we are participating in that process and already using that system. It's called an ECMS, um, an ICMS system. It's an electronic case management system and an integrated case management system. Where you, where you can also track cases, but it's not yet at the level where we are using it to a comprehensive manner and it, um, to track each and every case, for instance. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Pierre. Before I, I get Sip's question, um, I actually would like to check with uh, Tamiwa and um, uh, Prof. Gertrude. Uh, the question was, how do you deal with the double counting uh, problem of the same uh, survivors, assuming that you encounter the challenge? Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think for us, it's very simple. Um, since we are tying uh, our records to phone numbers and then encoding that phone number, it's easy because uh, if you report, your identifier becomes your phone number. Uh, and, but we don't tie a name to your phone number. So you can be anonymous, but at least you have a phone number for us to track you with. So that's way we're able to eliminate double counting. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Tamil. Uh, Professor Grace, uh, get it. Could you please repeat, repeat the question? Um, Dr. Mbomi was talking about the challenge we face in South Africa where you have double counting. So the same uh, survivor of sexual assault uh, will be counted twice uh, and you actually then inflate the numbers of people e e that have been uh, affected by sexual assault. Uh, how do you, do you have that challenge? Are you aware that you have it? And if so, how do you uh, uh, mitigate against it? Uh, I hope I've uh, captured the question well, Dr. Mbomi. Yes, thank you. I know that it's happened in some case, some cases because the NGOs offer free access to healthcare, for example, because it's difficult for poor, poor women to access. Sometimes they go twice to be sure that they can have access to healthcare. This is just the difficulty that is there because of the lack of infra the health infrastructures, but it, it is not general. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Prof. Gertrude. Um, I see a point that was raised by um, Dr. Mbomi uh, in terms of interface. Uh, it takes me back to a comment that was written by um, doc Dr. Nehama in one of the Africa Czech articles where she talks about uh, the importance of releasing the frequency of release uh, of statistics, uh, because if we have that, then we are able to design and uh, assess crime uh, for, for crime prevention, because things 
we, we get the data timelessly as opposed to the sub-reporting uh, which happens uh, annually now at some stage uh, it was quarterly. So um, it's actually going to be interesting even uh, with you advocate Pierre, the information that you have, case management, integrated case management system, uh, how we can actually interface it with the other uh, entities within the cluster and also the frequency thereof, uh, because I think it will help uh, to, to address uh, issues timelessly. Uh, Sips, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Judy. Um, Mpumi has covered the double counting. The other issue that is important is the re repeat offenders. Um, how do we also count them if we were to create a dashboard? Because I think um, in South Africa, it has been determined that most of the, the rapists are repeat offenders. Um, uh, they might have repeat, uh, raped more than um, once. And again, the, the survivor themselves might be going to the police station on, on, on different cases, maybe five times a month, not on the same case. Um, I'm just one worried about the, the system that Nigeria is using, that it, it might be recording a phone number and the case might be treated as one case instead of different cases uh, raised by one number. And uh, my second question is to Pierre. The, the cases, you know, with adults, not all the cases are, re are registered uh, with the police, but they've gone through the TCC um, services. How are we capturing that? Because in our data, that's a rape case um, that needed to be reported. How are we taking those stats and adding them to the rape stats? Or are they not many? Because she, he said uh, there's case management. In case management, what happens even if they're not being followed up by the person, the survivor themselves, but it should have been a case that it's, it's followed. Um, uh, if we look back at the DNA issues as well, to say, why are we not testing people who are already offenders and sitting in jails? to see if they are not the offenders when they go out um, after they've been paroled or finished their sentences. How, how do we bring those together and align the processes again? Uh, I hope my, my two questions are captured. Thank you, Dr. Jude. Thanks very much for those important questions, uh, Sips. Uh, Dr. Tamiwa, on the repeat offenders, uh, with that one number, uh, are you able to, to, to identify different cases from the same number? Um, well, that falls outside the scope of, um, of the project because we are focusing on the survivors. Uh, but just um, answering the question generally, I think um, it will be very difficult because um, right now there are uh, the sort of the database to track uh, the offenders register is not, um, you know, it's not always updated. If there is a digital one, I'm not sure there is. Um, not in all states anyways. Um, and then, you know, if you go to the police station or even in some, in some cases, um, yeah, the law enforcement, you have a whole range of fiscal channels that you need to keep track of. Um, there is a particular um, organization here in Nigeria that, you know, has been working on access to justice um, and they try to, um, you know, keep track of, of this, but it's, it's a big, end, big endeavor to track multiple fiscal channels, it requires a lot of resources. Eighty-five percent of the adult uh, survivors of uh, sexual assault. Report the cases. Uh, do you want to? Do we still have? Adv oh, sorry. Yeah, I think we still have him. Advocate Pierre, you muted. I know you've got a five o'clock, so. We won't ask you any questions. No, that's fine, Dr. Judy. I'm here. Unfortunately, Sorry. your question faded, so I didn't hear that the totality of your question. Can you maybe just repeat it? I heard Sips Matembo's one, but can you maybe just repeat your question? 
Uh, it's actually the sip September question. That oh, I is it a say. question? Yes, Fine. yes. Um, in relation to a question where I said that approximately 35% of adult, that's why I specifically um, specified that the adult victims, remember in line with the constitution, they do have a choice to open a docket or not. So for us, if it's not registered as a police docket, it's not counted as a sexual offence per se. We only count it as a victim that received services at the DCC. In other words, as a matter to report it. But once that victim, which some cases it does happen, that many of them will come back at some stage later and then decided to have that case being registered and investigate, then obviously it will be counted as part of the statistics going to court for a rape case or sexual offence case being registered accordingly. In relation to the other question on reoffending or recidivism, yes, we've picked that up for sure that many of uh, previous offenders or current offenders in line with serial rapists, um, colleagues will recall that I spoke about the DNA project that we have with the FSL Forensic Science Laboratory of SAPS. There we've picked up specifically in the DNA reports that are coming through, how many of those uh, serial rapists are unfortunately not only being serial rapists in a province or in a division, but also cross cross provinces. In other words, it's like they travel to certain provinces to commit these atrocities. So then, of course, then it becomes an issue on the centralization of that case to be finalized in a court of law so that those cases can all be put, pulled together, usually in the division where most of the cases are located so that it will be trialed and prosecuted in that place. Um, the whole concept of reoffending and the management of reoffending and having a, a program available in relation for offenders at prison is, is maybe something that DCS can talk more in detail about. And I'm not an expert in that regard, but I know that it's a constant focus for DCF to have programs, rehabilitation programs in place to address the unfortunate part of recidivism as well. Thank you, Dr. Judy. Uh, thanks very much, Advocate Pierre. Just to follow up quickly, I just need to understand when I get a report from the TCC, a, a rape is a rape, whether it's reported a, for conviction or not. If you saw or they saw 60 cases of rape and only 30 reported for conviction, what will your report show? 60 cases of rape or 30 cases of rape? Remember, Dr. Judy, for us, it's about the services that we provide at the TCCs. It's not necessarily per se on the offense. Those are the statistics that we collate to determine the seriousness or the impact or rather um, the mammoth task that we're dealing with when we're talking about sexual offenses. So if a victim comes to a TCC and it's clear that it was and she or he requires services at the DCC, if it's an adult victim, those services are rendered. If the victim then requires not to open a docket, for us, it will be allocated for our stats and our purposes as um, a victim that received services. It will not be allocated necessarily as a rape or any other sexual offense matter. But the moment that case is being registered for whatever the offense allegedly might be, then of course it's registered accordingly. That's why you will in that's why you will would have heard colleagues that previously when I spoke, I said of the matters reported at, at TCCs, 90% of them are sexual offenses, and of that 65% are on the offensive rape. In other words, there I'm talking about those matters that have been dockets registered and open accordingly for that particular investigation. Thank you. Okay, understood. Thanks very much for that feedback, Advocate. Uh, Jude, please come through. Uh, before you come through, uh, Barry, I know we're overstepping the mark now. Can you give me 10 minutes more? Sure, you can carry on. Right. Thanks very much. Uh, Jude, please come through. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Judy. Um, I really want to thank all the panelists for the great and informative session. Um, and equally want to personally thank Dr. Brody for raising the AI ethics concern. That's something that we really, really need to pay a lot of attention to, uh, given the usefulness of AI. We, we're losing you. Are you able to hear me now? 
So I was just thanking Dr. Brody for raising the AI ethics concern. Your audibility is erratic. Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Sorry. Um, so I was just thanking Dr. Brody for raising the AI ethics concern. This is really something that we really need to pay a lot of attention to. Um, moving forward, I believe in a bottom-up approach. And I, I, my question to the panelists is, when we talk of the TCC and other groups that exist in other countries, who are the people on the table making the decision? Do we ensure that we have women that understand the um, the level uh, of what we've lost you and, uh... Can you hear me now? Um, um, Can you hear me? Jude? It seems to be, um, Jude? Kind of seems to be yes. yours. Uh, we can't hear you. you. Can you write on the chat? Yes, oh, exactly. Am I the problem? I'll oh, just no, type on the chat. It seems to be on your side because we can hear Jude. Barry, Barry. Okay. Can Barry, can you hear me now? Yes, you, you're coming across clearly. Wow. So, okay. So I was just saying that um, it would be very interesting to know who are the people on the table making these decisions. Because we know that even different side ethics, when we have the wrong people on the table making the decision, it enforces the stigma that some of these victims are already facing. And then moving on to the AI, um, I want to pose a question which I would really want uh, to, what to comment on. We'll be looking at situation of, for instance, borrowing from Thailand, which really helped a lot with women that could not report some of the cases ending up reporting. Thailand created something called a cis boat. And with this cis boat, women could just sit on a messenger and type a message, and then they're able to get information as to how to report to the police, how to preserve the evidence, what type of evidence to preserve, which women group are working in the country to ensure that they have them and uh, the compensation that will be entitled to by the law. So I just wanna find out if countries like Nigeria, South Africa are moving towards this model of creating this and secondly about the bottom up approach, ensuring that the women who understand the gravity of this issue are on the table in the decision making table, over. Barry, um, please, please take yeah. over. I have connection problems, so I didn't hear most of what Jude said. Okay, um, I think we did get it clearly on my side. I'm sorry about that, Judy. But I, I wonder whether one of the panelists wants to answer that. Um, yes, I can uh, jump in um, on you. the question of AI. Thank, uh, thank you, uh, Jude. Uh, <clears throat> so I think uh, to answer this question, I'll just... Uh, uh, you know, just put the caveat here that look, uh, we are using uh, we are for us a particular project safe. We are using uh, technology, so we are operating on the assumption that um, so our beneficiaries have access to uh, technology to preferably a mobile phone. Um, and so, to answer your question, it's two pronged, uh, particularly around how to help increase reporting and how we can use AI in some ways to better detect. Um, report, um, you know, incidents. Uh, in terms of increasing reporting or even having access to reporting channels, um, we uh, pride ourselves on being able to or being able to deploy um, tools that don't um, leave any footprint. So, for example, being able to use a USFD, which allows you to report uh, or flag yourself or, um, uh, as being vulnerable within 10 to 15 seconds. That way, you're able to um, quickly do this um, in the you know quickest opportunity you have. Um, away from you, uh, from the abuser. We also don't send text messages to um, to the survivor. Again, we don't want to leave any footprint on the phone. And for those that have access to a smartphone, where um, we are able to, uh, we are actually right now we are in the process of implementing a process where um, the mobile, the application on the phone, the icon can be camouflaged. Uh, so, for example, you can click on something and the icon changes from what the icon is for reporting to uh, maybe a cartoon icon. And that way it's able to throw off um, you know, the abuser if the abuser picks up the phone. That's on the one hand for reporting. Um, of course, there are a whole range of other uh, solutions that can be deployed to, um, to give access to reporting and access to information when you need it. But in terms of um, the second part, which is um, also what we do, uh, we try to take a proactive approach. So when, for example, you flood yourself um, or you try to report an incident via USSD or via the mobile application or any other, um, or any of our channels, we try to use what we call our interactive voice response system. 
um, that makes an outbound call to you um, and is able to you know, ask you um, specific questions, just the same way you call your bank and the bank says press one for this or press two for that. We're also able to make this very um, non-invasive um, outbound calls. And we particularly choose the specific time that we make these calls um, to, the, to the beneficiaries to ensure that um, it's almost like a sweet spot when they're most likely out of home um, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, away from the abuser. Now, of course, it cannot be perfect if we are in a lockdown situation, but uh, we are normally in a lockdown situation. So we try to pick the perfect time that ensures that uh, we're able to reach out and survive it. And so where you start using AI here is again, where we want to get to where um, as you, um, on, on the IVR system, you're able to ask the beneficiary to record a certain how they are feeling or what they would like to report you know, in, a, in a couple of words. And we would like to be able to use AI to start you know, doing some analytics on the voice, for example, to understand the tone or the change in tone of each, of each beneficiary's voice. And that way we can start flagging um, you know, uh, if the beneficiary is actually in a vulnerable situation or if the vulnerable situation is deteriorating. And then of course, um, another one, another area that is more within the realms of security is the use of safe words, um, wherein, for example, a, um, you, you, you ask the person a question and there is a, the, the, the safe word can be pineapple. If the person says on anything other than that, um, you know that the person is in danger. And so those are some of the um, things that, you know, uh, the features that we are, some of which we have implemented, some of which we are looking to implement. Um, of course, you need data uh, to be able to implement some of these um, solutions, like Nakema mentioned. Um, if you use um, an off-the-shelf algorithm, you might just end up causing more harm um, than good or not even having any um, net benefit. So um, those are some of the ways in which we can use um, AI and just um, tools to, uh, to improve reporting and, of course, um, ensure that we can keep um, the cases um, well keep access to the reported cases high. Obviously, once you reduce the number of cases, because that would mean we are making progress. But yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that. I think we're going to close now. We've we've actually lost our chair. I don't know if you can hear Judy, but um, Judy did uh, type in the chat that she's lost connection. I still see her connected, but I'm not sure if she can still hear. Um, we've uh, gone on a bit beyond our, our closing time. So I think uh, it's uh, probably the right moment to close. Um, I just want to really thank you um, on behalf of Dr. Dlamini um, and the uh, panel and to thank the panel for the uh, fantastic inputs and all the uh, people that have um, posed questions and participated. We will post the, um, the complete recording on the website where people registered. I've, uh, the uh, link has also gone into the chat a few times. Uh, so uh, once it's uh, downloaded, it'll be put up there for people that want to listen again or, or share it. And please use the um, comments on that same page to, um, um, to put any comments you might have. And um, keep in mind that it is moderated, so it might uh, take a bit of time for you to um, to kind of see your comment come up. But we but we will put them up there, and let's keep the conversation going. And um, Judy has mentioned that she wants to uh, keep this conversation going. We will through um, uh, through Vits or through through other partners. We will um, continue to. Um, um, to host webinars like this. So thank you everyone for your participation and please be safe and uh, we'll talk again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre, and thank you all the panelists.